museum activities over the pandemic, uh, supporting us virtually, uh, you know, with the virtual online auction and the Zoom uh, lecture series. Uh, it is very great to be back in person. Um, Julie and I, the, the program coordinator of the museum, were joking. They were like, how do we do this again? It's been, <laughs> it's been a while since really we've done this. really can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? Talk, just talk closer. The mic's on. Okay, can you hear me if I talk a little closer to... Okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, we, we had to remember how we did this again because it's been a while, um, but thank you for coming back. Uh, this is our 55th annual open house. Uh, the theme of today is geologic coring. Um, so we have some phenomenal speakers who are going to talk about ice cores and continental drilling and ocean drilling. Um, if you haven't already, please check out the mineral sale. And thank you for your support buying the minerals. And then we have three different kids activities going on, and that's part of Scott Hall, all about geologic coring. Um, so we'll be around. Please come find us if you have any questions. But I'm going to turn it over to Bill Selden, our retired curator, who is going to be doing the introductions for the speakers today. So, Bill, thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks. Good morning and welcome. It's, gee, it's nice to be back in person again. That's only been a long time. And uh, as you know, I'm the, uh, the former curator of the museum and I have organized in the past numerous um, speaker programs. And I understand very clearly just how important that sort of thing is because it's, it's an interface between the academic and public communities. And it's, it, it's really, and it's a rewarding thing to do. It, uh, <coughs> it makes it possible to feel in contact with people. And because of that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. John Higgins today, who's going to be speaking about his work, his research. It is, um, he has he's made numbers, numerous discoveries on the air bubbles from Antarctica in ice. And in addition to the discoveries he made in his research, I'm sure there has to be some kind of an adventure just getting in and out of Antarctica and collecting those cores. Dr. Higgins, please welcome Dr. Higgins. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to be here again, live and in person, you know, talking about our science and, and getting to, to share with you all some of the stuff that we've been up to over the last few years, although I'm not doing it as, um, going down to Antarctica as near as often as we would have liked um, over the last few years. So I guess this is thanks to you to the Rutgers Partners Explorers and, and the various things here, but we'll get on to my talk. All right. So. Um, what I'm going to be giving you guys an overview of is, is research that's kind of going on in my lab um, starting over kind of a decade ago um, when I arrived uh, at Princeton um, as a postdoc and kind of continuing on through the present. And what we're really interested there is in, in thinking about and using ice cores to understand what Earth's climate has done in the past with an eye towards kind of understanding and predicting what it may be doing uh, in the future. And so. Like any good uh, professor and PI, you know, I'm up here giving the talk, but most of the work was done by other people, um, two that I want to highlight here because a lot of the results uh, that I'm going to show come from their work. Uh, PhD student Dr. Eugene Yan, who worked with us um, a number of years um, through very recently doing his PhD at Princeton, and then Dr. Sarah Shackleton, who's a current postdoctoral fellow working with myself and Michael Bender. And if the name looks familiar, um, she'll be happy to talk about it. She is distantly related to the other um, Shackleton um, who did uh, a bit of Antarctic work about 100 or so years ago. Um, so you've probably come across uh, articles in the in the popular media and the news. What's that? Can I turn the house lights off? Ah. Well, we want to turn the house lights off then. I can pull move switches. If they, they might have changed, but I think I can help with this. <laughs> These are the problems. These ones? Yeah, these, these are the problems. Ah. 
talking while they fix it. All right, I will keep talking while we fix it. So uh, you probably read in the popular media or the newspapers various things about you know levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and how they are higher or highest today than they have been in millions of years or in human history. Great, now we can all see. So you may have asked yourself when looking at or reading these sorts of articles is where this sort of data comes from, right? How do scientists know that carbon dioxide levels today are higher than they have been in four and a half million years or in all of human history? And so, you know, this kind of motivates really what are the, the some of the big questions that, that I am personally interested in as a scientist, which is understanding Earth's climate history. And so the kind of statement I've got here is just saying that the geologic record contains periods where Earth's climate was warmer than today. And so accurate reconstruction of Earth during these periods, its temperature, the weather patterns, the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the chemistry and circulation of the oceans, and the size and composition of the biosphere represent the best and perhaps only way of validating global climate models outside of the observational record, right? So we have these very fancy, fancy numerical models that we used to predict the physics of Earth's climate system. How do we have you know, confidence and how do we ground truth those models? Well, one of the important ways to do it is by looking at Earth's climate history. So know the past to kind of see the future is what we would say. So for a lot, of, uh, a lot of us, you know, thinking about global climate is a tough task, right? The Earth is a big place. There's a lot of different temperatures that the Earth sees. You know, what does it mean when we talk about one or two degrees Celsius over the course of the Earth or changes in sea level, right? And so I've got a couple of maps to try to just illustrate from kind of a nurse scientist perspective when we talk about a few degrees of temperature change, what it means in terms of Earth's climate. So this is 2022, I guess a year ago. It's a little bit dated. You have a temperature on Earth that averages about 15 degrees Celsius, which is about one degree Celsius warmer than it was prior to the Industrial Revolution. Sea level today is about maybe a quarter of a meter higher than it was maybe in 1850. So, about, you know, a little bit higher, but not too much. And then carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, which we've had a lot of, of information about, are currently about 420 parts per million. And that represents 140 parts per million increase over uh, the pre-industrial level. So prior to uh, industrialization of society, it was about 280 parts per million. So we can think about, you know, if you've heard anything about Earth's climate history, you probably heard about the last great ice age, right? And so this is a period about 20,000 years ago where we had Earth's climate was much, much different. And so now I've got the same map of kind of North America. What you can see is a very large ice sheet that's sitting there over much of, of us. It kind of stretched almost all the way down to where we are now in New Jersey, couple kilometer thick um, sheet layer of ice. And this was a profoundly different climate um, for the Earth, right? And so Earth scientists have spent a lot of time understanding what were the climate conditions during this. And what we have found is that essentially during this period where we had this large ice sheet over North America, levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere were actually much lower than they were prior to the Industrial Revolution. They were about 190 parts per million. In addition, the Earth was colder, right? But it wasn't like dramatically colder, 10 or 20 degrees. It was only about four or five degrees colder. And yet we had this huge ice sheet over parts of North America. As a result of having this large ice sheet, that's a lot of water essentially that got taken out of the ocean. And so sea level was about 120 meters or 360 feet lower, dramatically different than it is today. So this is you know, nice and very interesting, and we've learned a lot by thinking about um, the Earth's climate system uh, over the last 20,000 years. Ah, just to drive this point even more close to home. So we, we're here down in New Jersey, but there are many features of kind of the Earth as we know it nearby that are related to this last glacial maximum. So the Long Island of Long Island, in fact, is a geologic feature that's entirely related to the terminus or end of this large ice sheet that was here about 20,000 years ago. And here I've got a map of New York City, Staten Island, Brooklyn, Manhattan, with this dark gray line here essentially showing you the termination of that large ice sheet that was sitting over um, much of North America, right? So just driving home, these are big changes in Earth's climate, you know, very large um, um, signals. So why are they important to kind of this question of Earth's climate in the future? Well, here's a plot now of 
what I'm showing is temperature on the y-axis and kind of time on the x-axis. And these are model runs where they take kind of the fanciest Earth system models to predict Earth's climate, and they try to predict what the Earth was like 20,000 years ago, right? So they take this information that we have on the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the size of the ice sheets, they plug this all into the model and they run it. And so what you can see here is two of the curves do a pretty good job of getting close to what we think the Earth was like, right? This is a pretty good indicator that the models are doing a good job at representing Earth's climate, right? We're getting the answer that we, uh, we're getting an answer that agrees with um, our records of what the climate was like. But you can see the red curve, right, diverges quite significantly. And the importance of this is that by adding this sort of paleoclimate information, we can say that that model is wrong, right? We can say, okay, this model is not reproducing what we see in the record. Back to the drawing board, let's refine it and try to improve it to improve our uh, predictions of, of Earth's climate in the future. So thinking about the last glacial maxima is all fine and good, but it turns out, as I said in kind of the outset, that there are periods in Earth history that were warmer than today, right? And this is particularly, we're interested in this because we think by adding a bunch of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we are going to warm the Earth's climate, perhaps returning us to a uh, period that it was more like sometime in the Earth's history when it was warmer. And so we can kind of turn the clock back a little bit further. Now we're looking at a snapshot of North America about three million years ago. <clears throat> and you can see a lot of the same, you know, a lot of the features uh, are, are still similar. North America kind of looks like North America. Florida, you can see here, is more or less totally submerged. The Great Lakes are missing, another feature of, of the ice sheet. Um, but, you know, this is what the Earth like, looked like, or North America looked like around three million years ago. And scientists have, you know, through some of the same methods, tried to reconstruct essentially what caused the Earth to be like this, right? What were the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? What were the temperatures? What were the sea level? And what we can see here is that the estimates for this is that carbon dioxide was somewhere between about 250 and maybe 450 parts per million. So today it's about 420 parts per million. So that range overlaps with where we are today, but it's a very big uncertain range. The temperature, people estimate, is only about 17 degrees C or something that's about 2 degrees C warmer or 1 degree C warmer than today or 2 degrees C warmer than the pre-industrial average. And then sea level here is about something like plus 20 meters or 60 feet higher than um, the present. So a substantial uh, rise in uh, Earth's sea levels. You might ask where these sorts of estimates come from. You know, this is where geology and things are useful. So this is an example here of a, what I'm showing you are essentially a beach deposit, right? So these are the words here describing essentially different aspects of beach deposits where you would find things like shells, stuff that you would recognize from the Jersey Shore today. The major difference is that this comes from a place, I believe this is in South Africa, that is about, the, the beach is about 4 million years old, and yet this beach deposit is sitting at about 60 feet above sea level today. And because we can understand kind of how the, the Earth masses have moved, we can do an, uh, get a guesstimate, essentially, of that, why, how that difference relates to the elevated sea level in the past, essentially showing us that sea level was much higher, maybe 20 to 30 meters higher um, um, during this period. In addition, you have evidence that life was very different. So here's a, a paper that came out a number of years ago looking at essentially camels that were roaming around up in the very high Arctic during this period, right? And so clearly, this was a period of Earth's history where the climate was much different than today. It could support um, you know, large mammals way far in the north where they wouldn't exist, and sea level was much higher, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to understand why, right? What were fundamentally the reasons why this climate was the way it was? Was it because atmospheric carbon dioxide was higher? So we can place these sort of kind of snapshots of Earth's climate that I've shown you in the last three slides into a much longer record of Earth's history. And now I've got a plot showing us the last five million years, and I'll kind of break this down pretty slowly, essentially starting from the bottom and moving to the top. So we've got the three different snapshots are showing you by the three different dots we've got here. One, two, and three. And what you can see is they're on top of this record that shows a bunch of wiggles. And it starts here in red, and then gets orange, and then gets down to blue. And what these wiggles are, are essentially measurements of the chemical composition of, uh, of protists that live in the ocean. And they live, and they grow a shell, and then they die and essentially sink to the bottom. And I think we're going to hear a bit more about this maybe later from Liz's talk. And essentially, scientists have been taking these sediments from the bottom of the ocean for many years and measuring the chemistry and creating sort of records like this. And what this record shows us 
is essentially a record of what the um, temperature, um, broadly speaking, the climate uh, of the Earth's ocean is doing. And when it's red, it's warm, and when it's cool, it's cold. And what you can see is over the last five million years, we've had you know, changes from, from it being largely warm and small, small wiggles up here to bigger wiggles and cooling as we move to the right. right? And so Earth has undergone these large scale chi climate changes. And we can place the snapshots that we saw in this context. right? So the last, the last great ice age would fit at the bottom of this last wiggle and the modern climate would be up here and the climate snapshot from three million years ago would be somewhere like that. Okay, so that's placing these snapshots into this longer record. And so then we want to ask the question, well, what you know, caused these, these climate changes, right? What is driving the climate system fundamentally? And to answer that, we're, we're going to look uh, to a first at greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this is now a record of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere from, again, chemical measurements in those same sorts of shells. And you can see that there's really good evidence that we have you know, the measurement we have today. This is actually just the, the modern level in the atmosphere and the last glacial maximum being much lower. But as you get back here into this area, the records get to be much more uncertain, right? There, there's just much more uncertainty with respect to what carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere was. And yet these are some of the same records that if we go back to those media articles, this is where it's coming from. So when they say carbon dioxide levels haven't been this high in four and a half million years, it's because these levels of carbon dioxide from the shell measurements essentially are indicating that carbon dioxide was that high three to four million years ago. Okay. And the final bit, just to place this in a human context, is I've got the human evolutionary tree at the top of this, right? So over this last five million years, essentially when we have evolved um, 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 Homo sapiens as a species, and so it's kind of, an, again, an interesting period to think about, you know, what has been the role of that climate change in, in the evolution of, of man more broadly. So there are aspects of this record that scientists are particularly interested in. First and foremost, we're interested in why this sort of downward trajectory that I've got pointed here. Why overall has the Earth gotten cooler over the last five million years? Was it related to changes in greenhouse gases or are there other things that were involved? We're also interested in things like why did these sorts of climate cycles get bigger? So you see over at the far left of this um, uh, curve, the wiggles are much smaller than they are at the right. And the right, far right side, these are the last great ice ages that we've talked about, right? And so we want to understand why did the, the ice ages get much bigger? Another aspect of this that you may have kind of seen subtly is that the length of the ice ages has actually changed over this time period. So in the beginning of this record, we have ice ages that occur once every roughly 40,000 years. But over the past million years, we've had an ice age roughly once every 100,000 years, right? And so we're interested in understanding what sets these timescales and why did they change roughly a million years ago? And I'm not going to get into the details of this, just trying to give you guys some of the insights into what are the interesting aspects of these climate records that scientists are trying to study. And one thing I will talk about today is what are the role of greenhouse gases and changes in greenhouse gases in this whole record, right? Do we, does the cooling that we have seen over the last five million years, is it largely related to a decline in greenhouse gases? Thus, can we understand why the climate was related, was warm in the past, essentially, is the same reason that we're worried about it warming um, over the next hundred years. So just to drive that home, the big question that we're interested in here, were levels of atmospheric CO2 and other greenhouse gases higher in the Pliocene, this period about three million years ago, and what role did it play in climate change over the last five million years? And you don't have to take our word for it that this is kind of an important and interesting problem. This is the IPCC report from 2014, just showing you a statement saying that with medium confidence, they understand that the, sea, that, um, the climate was warmer during this period of the Pliocene, three to 3.3 million years ago. And with medium confidence, we understand that carbon dioxide concentrations were higher during that period. And if you're wondering what medium confidence means, according to the IPCC, it's about a coin flip, right? So that's not a particularly high degree of confidence that the Earth was warmer and that carbon dioxide levels were higher, right? So there's a need to improve these sorts of estimates. In addition to just greenhouse gases, there are all sorts of other things that us as Earth scientists would be interested in knowing about the Earth three to four million years ago. We'd be interested in knowing about greenhouse gases other than carbon dioxide. So you've probably heard about methane or N2O or a variety of other gases that we worry about. What role do they play in climate change in the past? 
We've got things like the terrestrial and mean bio, marine biosphere. Who lived what and where, right? We talked about camels and, and things like that. How was the Earth and the biosphere different during this period um, when it was warmer three million years ago? Same thing with ocean atmosphere circulation and climatology, right? How, how did the Earth's you know, hydrological cycle operate differently? What were all the consequences of this warmer world? Okay. So probably what you've been waiting to hear about is, is what is the role of ice cores in this whole thing and when am I going to get to exciting pictures of Antarctica. So it'll start hopefully pretty soon. So polar ice cores is archives of Earth history. So what are ice cores? They're a pretty simple and straightforward way of understanding and, and preserving a record of what Earth was like in the past. And so you can think about ice cores as starting with just snow falling on the surface of you know, a place like Antarctica. So this is a picture of the uh, East Antarctic Polar Plateau. And in a place like Antarctica, when snow falls, it tends to not ever melt. And so it just accumulates and accumulates and accumulates and accumulates. And so it, as it happens, when you start snacking, stacking snow on top of snow on top of snow on top of snow, you essentially start to compress the snow that's at the bottom of that. And scientists have, of course, a name for everything. And so we take that snow and we transition it into something that's called fern. And the little letter I've got there just is showing you that the density of this material is increasing. It's just getting compressed and packed by the snow sitting above it. And this happens over something like 10 to 20 meters, so 30 to 60 feet of snow essentially packing down and down and down. Now that continues to happen because, again, in places like Antarctica, you know, there's no melting going on. It's just accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. So you do that long enough and essentially that snow and fern gets compacted into ice. Right? It gets compressed into what we would call glacial ice. And the depth at which that transition to ice occurs is somewhere around 60 to 100 meters. So up to 300 feet down, you are essentially having this compaction and essentially this progressive transition from what had been snow, fluffy white snow at the top, to solid glacial ice at the bottom. And because it's kind of packing up in layers over time over time, it preserves this kind of wonderful stratigraphy, we like to call it, right? Where you go down and time gets older in a very straightforward and understandable way. And the bonus is that we can also use various aspects of that ice to study Earth's climate. So the one part we have is we have the ice and snow itself, right? And we can use the chemistry of the ice to understand something about um, uh, climate and temperature patterns in the past, but we can also use stuff that's trapped in the ice, things like sea salt and dust, things that are blown in and essentially trapped when, this, when these ice cores are, when the snow accumulates. But most importantly for me, and I think most excitingly, well, I'm just going to be biased here and say most excitingly for me, is that in addition to um, the ice itself, you actually trap these ancient bubbles of air. And you can think about these bubbles of air as essentially just the, the spaces in between the snowflakes that, essentially, that are air to begin with. And as this stuff gets compacted, they get brought along with it. And so eventually those air spaces get turned into bubbles. And those bubbles you can think of as just little capsules of the ancient atmosphere. And they contain all of the things that the atmosphere co today contains, carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases, these uh, uh, little numbers 40 argon and 38 argon, the AR, I'll talk about there more later if it looks like gibberish. But the bottom line is that they trap samples of ancient air. And there's really not a better way that you can do this in the geologic record or a closer way of getting to essentially being able to go back and measure what the composition of the atmosphere was in the past. So I'm sad to say that I bet you guys aren't going to be able to hear this in here, but the people online will enjoy kind of a what sounds like Rice Krispies as this ice core that you're seeing in this video here is dropped into a, into a pail of water. So it turns out when you're in Antarctica, the easiest way to get water is to melt ice and snow. Um, these ice cores that we're not using for science turn out to be a very efficient, you know, there's a lot of water in there and so it's great to melt them. And so if you're listening online, you'll, and you can kind of see all these bubbles rise on the surface, but it sounds like Rice Krispies. And this is all these bubbles of ancient atmosphere essentially being released from this ice core, right? This is the stuff that we're interested in studying. So I'd encourage you to look at it online. It's, it's better than this. Okay, so how well do ice cores do of a record of preserving the atmosphere in the past? And the answer is a really good job. So the plot I'm showing you here on the right shows time going from 1850, which is considered kind of the start of the Industrial Revolution, to about the present. And what you can see in the black are actually what we would call the instrumental records. So that's people collecting samples of air and measuring the carbon dioxide in it. 
And what you can see in blue there are essentially measurements of the trap bubbles in ice cores. And what I hope you also see is that the blue and the black sit on top of each other, right? In this, especially in this interval right here where they're, have, they're overlapping, right? And that's telling us that the ice cores are giving us the same information as if we were to just go and measure CO2 you know, sitting outside um, today, right? And so ice cores are providing us an accurate representation of what uh, the atmosphere is doing in the past. This also shows quite nicely the rise in atmospheric CO2 that we've had over the last 170 or so years due to industrialization. Okay, so I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of all of the things that scientists look at in ice cores, but I'll give you a brief <laughs> overview on why we think they're so cool and important archives of Earth history. And there's two basic reasons. One is that they record properties of the whole Earth. You know, so the gases that are trapped in the ice cores are from the atmosphere. And for many constituents, the atmosphere is well mixed. So the CO2 that we measure in Antarctica is a great representation of the greenhouse gas levels over the whole Earth, right? And so those give you properties that are essentially we call global properties. The other thing is they provide us information on Antarctica in particular, right? And so we can look at the temperature in Antarctica. We can look at what dust is being transported to Antarctica, things like this. And so not only do we get a window into what the globe and the whole Earth is doing, but we get an important window into what the kind of big ice sheet, uh, one of the big ice sheets um, on Earth is doing at the same time. And so just flipping through these quickly, so we can measure carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. It tells us something about the carbon cycle and radiative forcing in the atmosphere. We can measure methane, which again tells us about, is a greenhouse gas that tells us about radiative forcing in the atmosphere. It also tells us about the terrestrial biosphere, kind of the expansion and contraction of wetlands, what, what um, the hydrological cycle is doing. N2O, yet another greenhouse gas that we can measure. It's telling us something about the nitrogen cycle. Acetylene, this is a trace gas that one can measure in ice cores that actually people are using to develop ways of looking at biomass burning in the past, right? So looking at historical records of biomass burning and when essentially humans came around and started burning a lot of biomass. Um, we can look at things like the ratio of oxygen isotopes in, ox in the oxygen that's trapped there to tell us something about the hydroclimate in the biosphere. We can look at ratios of, of noble gases to tell us about the temperature and heat content of the ocean. And we can look at the ratio of oxygen to nitrogen to tell us something about the oxygen cycle in the atmosphere. So the bottom line is there's all sorts of things that we can do when we have these ice core records to tell us these sorts of global, global properties of Earth's global climate system. As I also said, we, we get a lot of information on Antarctica. So dust tells us something about atmospheric circulation. We can look at the amount of sea salt that's in these ice cores and they may tell us something about how much sea ice is extant around Antarctica at the time. And then we can also look at the chemistry of the ice to tell us something about Antarctic climate. So again, if you want to ask, understand any of these in particular, come find me sometime after the talk, but just be wowed at what we can do um, with ice cores. So to get to the nitty gritty, like what ice cores have been drilled in Antarctica and what's our contribution to this whole story. So here I'm showing you on the left is a map of Antarctica with each of these red dots indicating one of the main drill sites that have been uh, essentially drilled over the last 40 or 50 years. And these have been big operations um, conducted by kind of international or multinational groups. Um, and what you can see on the right is one of the, the European stations called Concordia Dome C, which was a big international effort that lasted, I think, 10, year, 10 years and costed something like $50 million. And the strategy you can see with all of these sites is that they are drilled kind of out in the middle of the ice sheet. And the reason for that is quite deliberate. And that's shown in the figure here on the bottom. So we talked about how these ice cores are made where you essentially take snow and you stack it up ad infinitum, you keep stacking it up. And so that's great as long as you are in called what's the center of the ice sheet, right? Because as long as you're in the center, then all that happens is the snow gets packed up and it moves down. So that would be along kind of this axis of the ice sheet right here. But anywhere else you have a problem and that is the ice will tend to flow. Glaciers tend to flow, right? And that flow is going to disturb that la nice layering that you've got and give you a complicated record. And we don't want that. We want a nice simple record that just goes and gets simply older as we go down. And so that's why the drilling essentially occurs preferentially in what are these are called these domes, right? The dome of this thing. So dome A, dome C, Vostok, South Pole, all of these are occurring out in places that they think of are domes. And this is great because we can develop these beautiful, long, continuous records when we drill down through the ice sheet, 
but it's a huge endeavor. We're drilling down two to three kilometers in the ice and essentially saving and preserving this ice core. And so this is, you know, 40 or 50 years by the whole world, and we've got maybe, you know, three or four different sites where we've drilled down to the bed and done the interior. That being said, these records have provided what I think are some of the best evidence that we have that Earth's climate is tightly related to the amount of greenhouse ga gases in the atmosphere. And this is kind of a plot of this showing this here. So what the top part is, and these are, I should say, all these records that have been generated from these two to three kilometer ice cores in the center of an Antarctica, in the East Antarctic ice sheet. So on the top is a plot of atmospheric carbon dioxide, right? So the main greenhouse gas. And on the bottom is essentially a measurement of the ice itself, a ratio of, of isotopes of hydrogen that tells us something about the climate in Antarctica, where warm is up and essentially cold is down. And what is really remarkable, and if you've followed you know, climate science at all, you've probably seen this plot before, is that these two things are tightly, tightly coupled, right? Every time that CO2 is high, Antarctica is warm, and every time that CO2 is low, Antarctica is cold. And these cycles repeat themselves. So we have this one great cycle here. This is the last great ice age that we kind of started at, we're talking about at the beginning of the talk. And then we have another one, and then we have another one, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another. And so we have these essentially eight cycles over the last 800,000 years of successive ice ages where Earth has cooled and warmed, and we've had the growth of these ice sheets, and it has gone in lockstep with the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, right? And so this is, I would say, some of the strongest evidence that we have that these two things are tightly coupled, right? And we know the physics of greenhouse gases, and so all of this kind of makes sense, right? This is the science that underlies, um, um, the, some of the paleoclimate science that underlies our understanding of global warming. So that is great. We've got this beautiful record that spans the last 800,000 years. Unfortunately, you know, we get beat by the deep sea sediments in the sense that they can go back millions of years very easily, right? And so now I've got that same record plotted on top of the record I showed you in the beginning with these shells measured from um, uh, deep sea ocean sediments, right, here on the bottom. And so what you can see is that we have the last, you know, eight cycles are represented here, but there's a big gap here. The other thing I want to point out is that the cycles that we see in the ice cores co coincide perfectly with the cycles that we see in the marine sediments, right? So when Antarctica is warm, the ocean is warm. When the ocean is cold, Antarctica is cold and carbon dioxide is low. All of these things are going together in lockstep again. But as you can see, the big question is what's going on? We would love to have ice cores that fill in this really big space here, right? We would love to get ice that's older than 800,000 years. And so that's really my lab's role and what our interest is in this kind of whole project, is finding ice that fills in these gaps. So how are we going to do it? Well, unfortunately, there's very few countries that are interested in drilling two to three kilometer, a lot of two to three kilometer holes to the bottom of the ice sheet just to find that the ice at the bottom isn't very much older or not older at all than they've already got. And it's hard to get a good idea of how old the ice is at two to three kilometers a priori, although there's a lot of efforts going into trying to understand the kind of glacial dynamics and do a better job of that. So we take a slightly different approach. So the approach that kind of the dome approach that we've just talked about is the one here on the left. And the one that we've been engaged in for the last roughly decade is working in what are called blue ice areas. And the kind of naive thing here is we're gonna let the glacier do the work of bringing the old ice close to the surface or in a place where we can essentially drill it cheaply. And so the idea here is that if we go to a place where we have some sort of topographic or bedrock high, so say you can think of a mountain range under the ice that obstructs the ice flow, that the ice might get deflected towards the surface. And maybe if we drill right up near the rocks here, we'll be able to access some of this older ice that's kind of brought from depth up closer to the surface. It's much cheaper to drill in these areas, etc. All sorts of good reasons to do it. That's why we call it old ice on the cheap. Okay, so where are we gonna try to go and do this? Well, here we've got a map of Antarctica. What I'm showing you in the black here is McMurdo Station. This is the large U.S. base where, kind of, um, where most of the U.S. operations are based out of. You get down here essentially from flying from New Zealand, which would be straight down here to the, the bottom of the picture. And then from McMurdo, we essentially deploy again in a smaller outfit um, and are dropped off uh, in this place called the Allen Hills, which is kind of on the edge of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. You can see here, and this is just putting in the context again of those big 
deep ice core drills in the domes. So what does the area like the Allen Hills look like? Well, this is a kind of picture showing you um, from the airplane as we're kind of flying in. The mountain range that, we're, that are called the Allen Hills is over here to the left. And the idea here, again, is that the ice sheet is essentially coming up to this mountain range and getting pushed up to the surface. And so we wanted to drill a bunch of holes essentially along this area here to try to, again, access some of this older ice that had been pushed up and brought to the surface. And this ice looks blue, again, just because you can think of it as deep. You know, this is ice that, is, that comes from deep in the interior. It's got bubbles in it, but it is otherwise just solid ice. And the white stuff here is kind of snow um, that would be drifting around on the surface. So one of the main challenges of going to these sorts of places is that, it, is that we can drill these shallow ice cores and we can you know, make some assumptions about how we think this old ice is being brought from depth, but we don't really know before we go and measure it how old the ice is. And so in order to kind of make this technique work, what we really had to do and what my lab at Princeton does now is, de is work on a technique to, de to um, determine the age of how old the ice is that we're going to measure. Right? Can we date the ice that we're getting? And this turns out to be uh, not a uh, trivial thing to do at all. It's very hard to find stuff in ice cores to date, to determine the age of. And this is where my postdoctoral advisor, who's now a professor emeritus at, at Princeton, comes in. Um, but he has, you know, came up with this incredibly, what I think is clever way of trying to date ice cores. And this is where I think, you know, earth scientists really shine, is that, that earth science is a great place to learn all about all aspects of the earth. And you never know when learning something about, say, the earth's interior or, the, or volcanism is going to apply in kind of some other area of earth science. So this is a case where, you know, a seemingly disparate set of facts end up being an incredibly useful tool for dating ice cores. So the story goes here is that potassium, which is a major element in the Earth's crust, that has one particular isotope, it's called potassium-40, that's radioactive and is decaying. It's actually, if, if you were to ask people what's the main source of radioactivity in our bodies, it actually comes from this source of uh, potassium-40. And it decays with a half-life of something like 1.25 times 10 to the ninth years. Incredibly long, right? So it's very slowly decaying. One of the things it decays to, it decays to two things. One is that it decays to an isotope of calcium, but the other it decays to an isotope of argon. And argon is what we would call a noble gas. And so it's an unreactive gas that once it gets made kind of doesn't do much. It kind of just goes into the atmosphere and accumulates. And so the Earth, over its last four and a half billion years, all of that potassium in the Earth has been decaying to argon and leaking out into the atmosphere. And so argon today in the air that we breathe is about 1% of the air, and all of that argon has essentially come from the decay of potassium and accumulated in the atmosphere over its history. And so Michael had the brilliant idea to say, well, if we could measure that in ice cores and essentially use the rate at which argon is increasing in the atmosphere, we could take some unknown sample of ice core and estimate its age based on how much less argon, it's essentially its argon deficit. And so the way that you could think about, this is just a, a graphical representation of how argon has grown in the atmosphere. So this is the Earth four and a half billion years ago. We've got a lonely atom of argon-40 in the atmosphere, but we let time pass and potassium decay, and we add a bunch more argon to the atmosphere. That's the very simple premise. Michael went, and before I started working with him, measured this in ice cores, and this is the result we get from these ice cores that span the last 800,000 years. And so what you see to the left is older ice, and the way you should read the y-axis is less argon in the atmosphere. So the negative numbers mean less. So there's less argon the further we go back. And this is the way we're going to use, uh, the approach we're going to use to date ice cores. We're going to take a sample of ice, measure how much argon it has in it, and compare that to the modern atmosphere. And if it's got a deficit, it's going to be older, and how much older is essentially predicted by the slope of this line. We've done some work improving the precision over the last decade or so. I won't bother you with that. Um, if you want to know what happens when we process ice cores in the lab, it's pretty simple. We essentially are interested in evacuating those bubbles from the ice core sample. And so here you can see us melting an ice sample in the lab. That air is essentially being extracted into a vacuum and frozen down somewhere else where we process it and kind of and as eventually measure it, its um, chemical and isotopic composition. So as I said, I've been at this work for a bit over a decade. We've kind of gotten fancier over the last um, decade as we've done this work. And we've had a lot of success essentially finding 
old ice and dating it with this technique. So starting back in 2009, 2010, we had our kind of first initial discovery of ice about a million years ago, uh, old. 2015, 2016, we had another uh, expedition that found ice around two million years old. And then I'll give a brief overview and stuff today that happened essentially just before COVID shut down. Um, we essentially came back from the field in January 2020. Um, and as you all know, everything uh, got shut down, you know, uh, weeks later. So what is Antarctic field like, like and how do we kind of do it? I'm going to show you this video while I talk about general stuff, which just shows up setting up one of the drill tents. So we're out there with a group of something like eight to ten. As I said, we get flown out into the remote, remote field where we're camping essentially like you would camp anywhere for about eight to ten weeks. Um, we get kind of frequent flights that will bring us, you know, food and supplies and take out ice cores. Um, but it's a place that's, you know, very difficult to work. And the principal reason is that it's incredibly windy. And so you have to wait for, you know, conditions to die down to do sorts of work like this, where we're essentially trying to erect this, um, I think it's a 10 or 15 uh, uh, foot tall uh, tent tower that will ultimately become the thing that holds the drill rig that drills the ice cores. And so what you're seeing here is just the, the assembly of the drill tent um, where the drill will be essentially placed inside. And I guess you could probably see as watching this video that while we're there, of course, it's 24 hour sun for all eight weeks that we're there. And so you can see the shadows just kind of move around um, in circles as the day goes by. This is now a video showing you what the inside of this process looks like. So the essentially the way that this works is that you have a drill that has an annulus and it's got a bunch of cutters on the outside. And those are what drill the ice core. Um, and they essentially generate, you can think of as chips, that once you generate enough chips, you can't drill anymore and you kind of have to pull the whole thing up. And so you kind of drill one meter at a time, pull the ice core out, process it, put the thing back in, drill another meter, et cetera, et cetera. And so this, you're watching now just a, I guess, a time-lapse video of doing this with one of the drill rigs we used in 2019. This turns out to be a much bigger drill. So we're, we took this one down there because we wanted to get a lot of ice samples. So this thing is about nine and a half inches diameter. So that it makes quite sizable ice cores um, to, and sometimes unwieldy. But this is what the processing looks like. And then we'll take this thing and we'll have to catalog it in the field, measure it, um, essentially put it in a plastic bag and put it in an ice core box that will then make its very slow journey back to what will end up being Denver um, about six months later. So through this work, these, this drilling and this ice core dating that I've talked about, we've been able to add, essentially try to start to extend this sort of ice core record. And so now I'm showing you what we would call a couple of snapshots because we don't get a nice continuous record that goes back. We get these essentially blobs of ancient ice you could think about that we're taking and analyzing. And so the exciting bit is that we've been able to find and date and start to analyze ice that goes back you know, as old as two to three million years. So these, um, the measurements that are showing you here are just new measurements of the um, uh, climate in Antarctica. And these are new measurements essentially of greenhouse gases. And you can see the blue dots now are kind of adding and extending the ice core record for which we can then compare um, to these sort of fossil records that we already have in existence. And kind of the most exciting stuff, which I've got shown here, just because the results are kind of less than six months old, um, by Sarah Shackleton was a core we drilled in 2019, um, 2020, showing us that near the bottom, we were getting samples as old as three and four million years, right? And so this is a very exciting set of observations showing that we're getting extremely old ice in some of these areas. You can also appreciate from this that this ice is complicated, right? So if this is a plot of age, versus depth, and this is above the bedrock in meters, you can see that the age goes down and it gets older, then it gets younger, then it gets older, then it gets younger, then it gets older. It's complicated, right? And so this is just a, a part of uh, the, it's a characteristic of these records that we're gonna have to deal with, but it's exciting nevertheless, right? We're getting these very ancient snapshots of Earth's climate system from these Antarctic ice cores. And so we can start to add in new data to essentially you know, complement the records that currently exist and extend these direct records of atmospheric composition um, either further back, even further back in time. And I think one of the more interesting things that we're going to be very excited about um, doing in the coming months um, and years is, again, measuring these greenhouse gas records and really trying to add 
a piece of uh, or, or data constraints from ice cores to say how high was carbon dioxide this period about three million years ago when the Earth was warmer, right? And what does that mean um, for our um, future climate? And so just to give you guys, to finish off with this and give you guys a sense of where you might be able to keep tabs on this if you're interested for the next decade, is that this project is, is the work I presented is kind of one piece of a much larger project that's called Coldex, the Center for Oldest Ice Exploration. You can find the website there. But this is run principally out of Oregon State, but its real goal is to, it's one of the big US efforts to um, uh, develop the ice core record in Antarctica, both through these sorts of um, uh, shallow drilling projects that I presented you today, but also kind of deep drilling, drilling projects in the interior that are more the classical approach that I talked about earlier. And so with that, I will thank you for your attention and be happy to take any questions. Yes. On the edge of the ice sheet where you've recently been drilling, have you gotten down to the bedrock? Yes. So we deliberately drill in places that are shallow enough that we can get down to the bedrock. So I probably didn't mention, but the holes that we drill are at max kind of 200 meters, so 600 feet, um, which I guess sounds like a lot, but it's a really shallow core from the perspective of kilometers. So we're always trying to hit the bedrock and we're drilling in places that are, the ice is thin enough that we can reliably hit the bedrock between one and 200 meters. Because it actually, as you, as you note, the oldest stuff turns out to be the, the stuff that's closest to the bottom here. Yes? Um, have they um, figured out what the engine um, for the CO2 levels four, uh, four million years ago was? Why they were what they were? And why they have changed? Uh, no, like why were they so high four million years ago? It's, so it's a great question. And, and I would say we don't know, I say we know generally, we don't know specifically. So. The carbon cycle of the Earth, the Earth regulates its own um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Ultimately, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere comes from Earth's interior and from volcanoes. And through a process of essentially reactions between that carbon dioxide and water and rocks on Earth's surface, that carbon dioxide eventually gets scrubbed out and deposited as, as sediments in the ocean. And so the Earth has this sort of natural carbon cycle that exists. And what, while we think that CO2 levels were higher three or four million years ago, the answer as to why lies in that natural carbon cycle. So there are hypotheses that maybe the amounts of carbon dioxide coming in from volcanoes was a bit higher. There are other hypotheses about how the removal of carbon dioxide might have been slightly different. But fundamentally, it's, it's a question of how the natural carbon cycle was different um, four million years ago. But also, um, where is the um, Allen Hills, where does it get that name from? Ah, it's a good question, and I, I don't actually know. I mean, most places in Antarctica got named by the person, usually white dude, who was down there first. Um, but I'm not particularly sure about the Allen Hills. You may have heard about it before because it was first famous as a, as a big place for meteorite finds, and it's still a big place for finding meteorites. And the reason is the same reason that we're kind of going there for the old ice, is because it has this sort of conveyor belt where ice is constantly being brought to the surface and essentially blown or ablated away. And if you're a meteorite, you get brought to the surface and you're not gonna get blown away, so you essentially get what's called stranded. And so scientists have been going to the Allen Hills and other blue ice areas for a very long time to find meteorites. And this meteorite, ALH840, blah, 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 something. NASA had this big thing in the 90s about Martian life from this meteorite. And that meteorite was from the Allen Hills. So long story, but yes, up front here. And I'll get around. Yes? Oh, um, I think I had to flip a question to the gentleman behind me, because I was wondering uh, about the CO2 cycling. Why was it so low during the past ice age? Because you know, what can we learn from that? And is this a signal of some other process? It's another great question. And this has been also studied very extensively by, you know, lots of scientists at, at Rutgers, but all over the place. And the short answer is that when we think about the Earth during the last ice age, where did that carbon dioxide go? It was stuck in the deep ocean. And the ocean turns out to be the big, it's the 800 pound gorilla when you come to carbon because, 
carbon dissolves very well in water. And so the ocean holds a huge amount of carbon dioxide. So if we took all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and all of it in, that's dissolved in the ocean, like dissolved in, you can think of it as like your carbonated water, and took the, summed all that up, 97% is in the water and 3% is in the atmosphere. So it doesn't take much shoving carbon in the ocean to take it out of the atmosphere. Now why was carbon accumulated in the deep ocean during the last glacial maximum? That's also a really big subject of debate, but people have all sorts of good ideas about the role that essentially biology has played and changes in ocean circulation, where essentially biology, you can think of it taking carbon from the surface and shoving it into the deep ocean. And so there are lots of, of, of really good and, and well-developed um, theories for how that process occurred, but it is entirely a natural one. But it is related because if, you know, there are lots of interest today in accelerating natural processes to move carbon around and biology and growing biology in the ocean is certainly something that people are, you know, playing with and talking about, right? And so they're, it's related to these natural processes that the scientists study. Does that answer your question? Somewhat. I did have one follow-up because I know when you're doing the ice cores, everybody talks about water being a universal solvent. What do you do to ingest from the diffusion of the gases, or do they no longer diffuse once the, the bubbles are frozen in the ice? Great question. So the question is essentially you get bubbles in ice, do they stay there, right? Are they moving around and diffusing? Because water yeah, is a universal solvent, everything wants to move around in it. So it's, we're fortunate in that it is cold enough in Antarctica and cold enough at these temperatures that that process is really slow. But it turns out that it is definitely something people worry about, especially with these really, really old ice cores because now you've given it a really long amount of time to do that sort of process. So it's something that we worry about, but the short answer is we think it's cold enough to not matter. So I'll move just to the right, yes. Well, I was gonna, just to follow up on that, also, these new ice cores where you're taking them from the surface, there's like more danger that there's been diffusion, right? When that, once they're brought closer to the surface and in an area where there's ablation, then isn't there more danger that there's been some well, the main thing, so uh, I, uh, diffusion from a temperature perspective, I'm not as worried about there because our ice is still very cold. What I am worried about near the surface is that you get a lot of fractures essentially that propagate in from the top. And that's going to introduce essentially modern air into your ice. And so, you know, one of the things I certainly didn't talk about, but we don't take ice from the top 15 or 20 meters. We have to drill down a certain depth till we're no longer think that we're in this zone of fracture. But it is always something that is, we're, we're constantly worried about drilling ice cores because you know we don't want to fracture and crack them because we care about measuring the gases that are inside them. And so there's a lot of aspects of that that are, that are thought about. That wasn't my actual question. That's so, fine. So my question is with the really deep ones, the, the like two kilometer deep ice cores, right? The compression isn't linear, right? So how do they figure out like actually how old those layers are like how did we figure out what that curve looks like great question so they end up it ends up involving a couple of different ways but some of them involve tying them to um, marine records in various ways there's some magnetic uh, anomalies that potentially can be used um, to tie them to marine records and then there are also some what are called independent chronometers where you can you can just generate the stratigraphy by measuring aspects of the air that I can talk about um, you know offline but that allow you to essentially get around this the fact that it's not linear right that you you need to take that core and and be able to tie it to something else that is dated if that makes sense yes amongst the atmospheric gases you were talking about doesn't sulfur and the sulfur oxides play a role in what you're interested in here? You didn't mention sulfur in your list of elements. No, um, and it is definitely true that people, so in terms of the sulfur gases, I'd have to think hard. One of the things that if things are really reactive, they end up being hard to measure in ice cores because they've essentially just reacted away. Sulfur definitely has been looked at a lot in ice cores, but I know it primarily by looking at sulfate aerosols and related to volcanic events. And so people are particularly interested in looking at the history of volcanism and volcanic events, you know, in ice cores. I guess I probably, you know, yes, I didn't mention that specifically, but that is certainly an aspect of it.
Yes. Yeah, could you explain what you mean by radiative forcing? So radiative forcing is is just the is the term to describe essentially the greenhouse effect, right? So the fact that these these gases will uh, absorb and readmit infrared radiation, and so they are, you know, radiatively, you know, they have gases that contribute to Earth's radiative balance and thus radiative forcing. There was a question on the zoo. Yes. Are there, any, are there ever any biological organisms like pollen, bacteria, et cetera, in the ice? So this is a good question. And we have, um, we are looking is the short answer, but we have reason to believe that in some of the oldest samples that there is some microbial or biological activity. And that is just because the carbon dioxide levels and methane levels for a few of them come back you know, with crazy numbers and other indications that there has been essentially biological activity in these sorts of oldest samples. Um, we don't know whether that biological acti activity is recent or old or over time. Um, you know, I think a lot of interesting things to find from, from looking at that. Yes? Are the oceans presently approaching a saturation limit as far as their ability to absorb carbon dioxide? Uh, are we presently temporarily overwhelming the rate at which it can process carbon dioxide? So it is not, the ocean is not ceasing its uptake. And so it will, it is not quenched in the sense that it will continue to take up carbon dioxide as, as quickly, as much as we spit it out. But its ability to take it up is not going to, it's not going to continue at the same rate, if that makes sense. So there are, you know, it will continue to play a role, but projecting out how that role will change and what the effects might be, you know, of various things, um, changes in circulation and the like, you know, there are some uncertainties, but it will continue to take up carbon. I think in terms of, you know, in terms of sinks that we are more worried about whether they would be saturated, things like the land biosphere is something that I hear a lot of people being a lot more concerned about, right? Is there a, a limit to how much regrowth that we can have? The ocean is a nice big reservoir and the deep ocean circulates very slowly. And so that water is gonna be coming up for a long time and sucking up CO2 from the atmosphere. You know, it may not do it as fast as we wanna do it, but you know, it's gonna play its part. Any more questions? I'm wondering about the time resolution of these records. So we're worried about global warming occurring over 20, 50, 100 years. Can you see that sort of resolution in these ancient records? Yes, yeah, so rates is a great question. And I think the answer for our oldest records is we don't know yet. I suspect we will not get that kind of time resolution. And so we will be talking about looking at Earth's climate kind of in an average sense over a period of time, as opposed to looking at an abrupt transition and looking at how that you know, warming has changed. That being said, there is a lot of work in the ice core and, and marine records looking at these what were called more abrupt events, you know, events that happen on decadal or centennial timescales and trying to tease out what are the mechanisms behind those and how they're related to various parts. And so I think our records may not play into that directly as they exist. You know, we would need the kind of the traditional ice core records, if that makes sense, um, to go back further um, to kind of capture those things. But there is some hope and there is certainly work being done on that in other parts of these projects. You were talking about the deep ocean, so you're implying that, um, that the, the carbon dioxide isn't, isn't permeating through the ocean very quickly, and that, that deeper areas of the ocean will have a, a similar carbon dioxide concentration to what they would have had thousands and hundreds of thousands of years ago. Is that what you're Not hundreds of thousands of years ago, but you know, parts of the ocean today, the ocean, you know, Parts of the ocean mix rather sluggishly, right? And so there are parts of the deep ocean that are seeing the atmosphere today that haven't seen the atmosphere for you know hundreds of years, many hundreds of years, right? And so from that context, that water you know is pre-human, you know, coming up, and so it, it last saw the atmosphere when it was had a much lower carbon dioxide level, and so you know it's going to it's going to retain that memory of the pre-human time, if that makes sense. But it's not infinite. So it's not going to last hundreds of thousands of years. And if we did this for another thousands of years, you know, we would have filled the ocean full of carbon sort of thing. <laughs>
say pre-human, you mean pre-industrial. Pre-industrial, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and, and if, if I can get a second question. Sure. How, how do you, when you're processing these ice cores and you're trying to make sure you get only the air from the bubbles, are you putting the whole core in an evacuated chamber? Or how, how do you? Yeah, so exactly right. So we essentially take a vacuum pump and put the ice while it's frozen into a glass container that we seal off and then pump out while it's still frozen that we then put it in kind of a liquid nitrogen bath and then pump out all the air surrounding the ice and so essentially then it's just ice within a vacuum within an ice within a glass container and then we close off that valve and now it's an isolated ice sample in a vacuum and then we let it melt and then we take that air and we'll essentially um, do various things to it, but ultimately freeze it down using probably liquid helium, um, you know, to transfer then over for chemical analysis. But there's a lot of, you know, if you ever want to come see a really classic looking laboratory setting with lots of glass and, you know, levers and things like that, come by the ice core lab at Princeton because it, it looks like that. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Antarctica is so far away. Do they correlate this type of data with other places like Greenland or the Arctic? Yes, and definitely, so the ice core record that goes back, the problem with Greenland ice is that Greenland is, is very, it's got relatively young ice, it's just because it snows so much there that you end up, you know, not the, you don't get very old ice because it snows so fast that it accumulates and then the oldest ice at the bottom actually isn't very old. But the Greenland record goes back like 100,000 or so years and one can very nicely correlate the Greenland records to the records in Antarctica, as well as the marine records over those same periods. And so there's a lot of inter comparison and intercalibration done between the people working on the ice cores and the people working in the marine um, uh, sections, as well as the people who are working in like terrestrial lakes and stuff like this. I mean, it is a, you know, um, yes, a lot of people worry about how to stitch these records together properly. Like biology, like the trees, when the ice sheet is out, they kill kills a lot of trees, which take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and pump oxygen in. That's right. Thanks so to somebody correlating that data, the biological data as well? Yeah, so in terms of the specific thing that, that you are talking about, people worry about that mass of carbon and where it goes, right? So when that ice sheet grew over North America, absolutely it probably took out a bunch of trees and there were other carbon as well. And so one has to budget for where that went into the Earth's system. And that is part of the story of the Ice Age you know, cycles, carbon dioxide going up and down. Um, and so, yes, uh, that, it's certainly something that people think about. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone.